So, Lisa, let, let's um, shift on to your theory for a moment. And um, you've done a huge amount of work, so there's a lot of moving parts to this. You know, we've got this classical view, uh, which has been so dominant to our understanding, and probably one of the simplest ways of understanding it is this notion that you you have um, parts of the brain associated with different types of emotion, so your hardwired emotions. You have fear circuits like the amygdala, and then something triggers that from an external perspective. So, it, you know, it's the proverbial you know, snake in the grass or it's the car about to run you over. And you get a triggered response, which is accompanied with what we all know, like the uh, the heart rate going up and adrenaline, cortisol coursing around your body and so on. And then you, you move into action and it's fight or flight and, and so on. That feels so intuitively right. Um, and, and I know science is built out of metaphors. It's a really simple, easy to go to metaphor, um, and it's been dominant in, in in our world for a long time. So let, let's what this constructed theory of emotions looks like. Can you can you give us the building blocks? Sure, and I'm really I really appreciate uh, that you that you asked in the way that you did because oftentimes when I'm talking with people, they'll ask me for the punchline. Um, before they have the, ingre- the ingredients, the, the building blocks. And I think, um, you know, one of the reasons why the classical view makes so much sense to us is that it's, it's grounded in uh, um, kind of a cherished narrative that um, has been in Western civilization for, well, it's really since the time of Plato. Um, and that's this idea that you have an inner beast and you have a rational self and the two are really, you know, um, there's a battle, a constant battle between your inner beast and your rational self for control of your behavior. And when your inner beast wins that battle, the assumption is that you're either immoral or you're sick. And, you know, scientists took that, 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 those ideas, which really come from Plato, and they sort of tattooed it onto the brain. Because, you know, the brain... <laughs> Um, is a it's like a big gray blob, and uh, you know it without special tools. It's it's really easy to impose uh, an, a, a sort of an architecture on it, um, uh, and you know that story kind of worked actually. When you just look at the brain with the naked eye, it sort of fits. Um, unfortunately, when we start really peering into the brain with specialized tools what we find is nothing that looks like that story. And when we start really observing how people um, experience emotion and uh, behave in emotional situations, and we look outside our own culture to other cultures that are, especially those that are remote or smaller scale cultures, we see tremendous variability um, in how people, even in our own culture, think about what you do what do you guys do when, when you're afraid? I mean, sometimes you might freeze, but sometimes you uh, will, uh, you know, attack, like yell, or, you know, sometimes people laugh in the face of fear. I mean, people do yeah. many things in fear. So I think the first thing to understand is that fear is not a thing. It's a population of instances, meaning... Um, Hmm. you do lots of things in fear. Your brain can make fear in lots of ways. There isn't really one. There's maybe like a vocabulary of fear that your brain can make. That's the first thing to understand. That's true of every emotion. Every emotion is really not a thing. It's a category and it's a variable category. What your brain is always trying to do is it's trying to um, make an instance of emotion that fits the situation that you're in. So that's the first, I think, building block is to understand that we're dealing with a lot of variability. That's what your brain has to deal with. I think the second thing to realize is that um, what is your brain's main job? Think about what your brain's main job is. Your brain's main job is not to think or to have emotions, to make emotions or to... um, smell or see or do any of those things. Your brain's main job, it evolved to regulate your body. That's what it's doing all the time as you're thinking and uh, feeling and seeing and imagining and so on. That's not how it feels to you or to me. 
but that actually is what's happening. And to do this, your brain is essentially, uh, you could say, running a budget for your body. So it's not budgeting money, it's budgeting salt and glucose and oxygen and all the things that, uh, all the resources that um, your, your brain needs to keep your body healthy. So it's trying to figure out where all of these nutrients need to go. And it, you don't have one bank account, you have lots because you have lots of systems in your body. So the way to think about it is, um, you know, uh, when your brain is going to stand you up, it's going to raise your blood pressure as you're standing or maybe just a little before so that oxygen can make it to your brain so you don't faint because that is metabolically costly for you to have to recover from a broken bone. So your brain is always trying to anticipate your, the needs of your body and, make, and meet those needs before they arise. And that's what body budgeting is for. And your body is always sending sensory cues about that body budgeting to your brain. And your brain has to make sense of those. Now, here's a really interesting thing. From a brain's perspective, you take the brain's perspective, it is trapped in a dark, silent box called your skull. So your brain is receiving sense data from your body. It doesn't know what's actually happening in your body. It doesn't know the causes of those sense data. It only knows the effects. So it knows something's going on down there. It just doesn't know what. It has the it has the effects, it, ha it gets the sense data, which are the result of something, but it doesn't know the cause. Similarly, out in the world, you know, your brain gets flashes of light and changes in air pressure, which, you know, transduce through your ear, becomes sound, and chemicals that become smell and taste. And again, your brain is receiving the results of some changes in the world, but it doesn't know what they are. So if your brain has to do body budgeting and it's got to figure out what it needs to do next to keep you alive and well, and all it has are the results of things happening, it doesn't know the causes, how does it achieve its goal? And the answer is it has one other source of information, and that is it has your past experiences that it has learned. So your brain, what it does is it, conjures or reinstates past experiences to make a guess about what the, sensate, what the sense data mean. And that's really what body budgeting is. So your brain is, is constantly from the moment that you're born until the moment that you die, it is um, trying to make sense, meaning, of sense data from your body and from the world in order to keep you alive and well. And it has to make guesses using your past experience. And not, none of this is happening consciously. It's all happening basically outside of your awareness. And the last piece, which is really cool, is um, that these guesses that your brain makes happen predictably. They happen before the sense data arrives. So basically, if we were to stop time right now, um, what would be happening for you, for me, for the, your, all of the, the listeners, all our listeners right now, is each brain would be taking stock of what just occurred and using past experience to make a set of predictions about what is going to happen next. What am I going to see next? What am I going to hear next? How am I going to feel next? What's going to happen in my body next? What actions do I need to take next? And then your brain starts to prepare those sensations and actions. And then it waits for the sense data to come from the world and from the body that, uh, to either confirm or, or change those predictions. And so when your brain uses past experiences of anger, to make sense of the sense data in the moment, your brain is basically conjuring up an instance of anger. It's your, you will be experiencing your racing heart and your flushed face 
and your tears as anger. And if your brain was using past experiences of fear, you would be experiencing your racing heart and your flushed face and your tears as fear. And if your brain was using past experiences of joy to uh, make sense of those sensations, you would be experiencing joy. Your brain basically uses your past in order to make sense, to predict and make sense of your immediate future, which becomes your present. <music> 